Okay, our uh, Sedona Fire District's uh, monthly meeting is now in session. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silence. Take a moment to remember the eight police officers and three firefighters that have passed since our last board meeting. Thank you, please be seated. Okay, it is now our final budget workshop session. So with that said, we'll get started into the budget workshop. Uh, Gabe? All right, uh, Mr. Chair, I think before I kind of get started, uh, Chief, did you want to, or things you just want to add your points as we get to it? Um, well, I'll just real quickly. So I asked Gabe uh, when, you know, after last month's meeting and hearing from labor and, and the presentation, I asked him for the simplicity of kind of looking at the range to, you know, and it was my understanding from the board is just to look at some different different options and what they look like. So ultimately, um, that draft budget option sheet presents to you what, what was presented last month, um, a mid range and a, a high range, if you will, based on the security cola. So with that. All right. Thank you. So um, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. This is the uh, the final budget overview. Um, Obviously, the last couple of budget presentations that we've had, we've gone in uh, pretty in depth um, to the budget. Uh, today, we're going to kind of focus on a few aspects of the budget. Um, one, just kind of an update on the budget process, where we're at in the schedule. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time just kind of discussing kind of an overview of, of the capital plan, uh, which you have in the packet there. Um, and then finally, we'll kind of finish off with, you know, the three options that were kind of presented. Um, and then at this point um, tonight, looking for kind of tentative adoption on, on one of those options. So um, we've, uh, we, this process started back in February, early February, when we got our assessed value numbers. Um, staff has been working diligently on putting together their requests for, for budget for next year. Uh, Chief and Labor have been working on the needs um, from a uh, wage and benefit perspective. Uh, we have the, the culmination of all of that work in front of you. Um, currently, the budget package you have in front of you is based on the option one on your sheets when we talk about what's in there, which is uh, you know the 6% the COLA and the 6% drop incentive. Um, from a scheduling standpoint, after the meeting today, we're asking again for tentative adoption. We're required to post for a minimum of 20 days. Um, that will take us to our next board meeting in June, where we'll hold a public hearing on budget and then ask for final adoption. What you decide on today and what we post today essentially sets the, the top number for the budget. We can come back in June with a lower number. We can come back in June with the numbers moved around. <laughs> We just can't come back in June with a higher number. If we have a higher number in June, we have to repost for another 20 days before you guys can hold a public hearing and take action. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind as well as we kind of get towards that final, whatever that final motion is on, on you know, um, a tentative adoption and posting, um, keep that in mind. So starting off, one thing I wanted to spend a little bit of time on, and I don't have all the pages up here in the in the PowerPoint, but you do have them in your packet starting on page 58 of the of the budget book. Um, and really what I wanted to do is take a moment and kind of just talk about our capital plan and, and what's included, proposed included for next year, um, and what we're looking at. And so I'll give you guys kind of a moment to get there. So and you can kind of follow along on the top here. The top's kind of the summary of that plan. Um, but before I talk about what's included for next year, I want to take this down to kind of towards the bottom on the 2023 column on the summary where we see proposed capital funding for 2023. Um, and you may recall the budget that was adopted for this year, we were projecting about 1.4 million funding to capital. 
However, based on our budget performance this year, as well as previous budget performances, where our overall fund balance is, we're actually projecting to transfer a full 2.9 million out of general fund dollars to capital fund dollars. And as you can see what that does to the, the bottom line on our capital plan is it actually gets us in those later out years, 29 and 31, closer towards the zero. If you look at this book last year at the same time, those out years were in over million dollar deficits. So we're able to use the performance we've seen over the last couple of years, um, transfer those funds over. We still leave a, a healthy fund balance in our general fund, but this helps ensure kind of the sustainability of our capital plan as we start to look into those out years. So kind of going back up and now starting on column uh, for fiscal year 2024, one thing we have in there is, is debt service of about 770,000. Um, and really what we're looking at, at that, and the big driver of that um, is some proposed financing um, as well as some costs for um, our, our station four and station five, both looking at kind of starting the construction and starting the process right. of that. I don't know if we'll actually incur um, some of those costs in this year, or if that'll really be probably more into 25. So obviously we wanted to start planning for that. The, I will say, however, um, some of those costs that are being borne by the general fund. So there's a, a combination of capital fund funding on the debt service and general fund funding on debt service. That gave that a best guesstimate because I can't say I could possibly put a concrete figure in there if we don't even start the project type of thing. What could affect it? Right, obviously interest rates could affect that. I mean, the, the, what we end up as the ultimate cost um, to build, uh, it's kind of the best guesstimate at the time. Mm -hmm. so, so good, good question. So, yeah. Again, with that, if, if in fact we do not get to that point, then those funds go where? Back into the capital fund, back into? Correct, those funds stay then in our capital fund okay. and don't get dispersed. And, and typically what you'll see really in a capital fund is it's not like the capital needs ever go away. Um, it's we, we, we may defer. So that line, that column and that line gets moved over a year um, and, and or, or dollars get allocated somewhere else. But really, if we don't use it, that money then stays within the fund for, for other purposes. Right. Um, continuing <clears throat> down for, um, for next fiscal year, we've got station repairs and remodels. The biggest thing um, in there is for station three, some site improvements. Um, then under vehicles and apparatus, we have a couple items. Um, one, if we're able to get a chassis, which talking to the chief this <laughs> earlier today, that's a bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, we do have a planned um, ambulance re-chassis for next fiscal year. Obviously, supply chain has drastically changed our ability to um, do things in the years that we originally anticipated. Um, earlier this month, we had a client um, approve an engine purchase that won't be delivered for 36 months. So that's it's kind of hard to sit there and say we're we're approving a, a purchase for a, for a uh, fire engine that we're not going to see for three years. Um, so it's it's definitely fluid, and again goes back to the value of this plan is we're not earmarking and allocating dollars in a line item budget that we're levying taxes on to make that purchase. We're saying over this period of time, these are the funds we need to achieve our capital needs, and we want to have level funding going to that. And that allows us to kind of be fluid and adjust for, for these kind of unknowns that we're now having to deal with. Let me ask you a question. Depending on who you're listening to, who you read, and so on and so forth, projection is for a recession coming up. Yes. And uh, it's more likely than not likely. And so factoring all this stuff in, what have you, um, um, the best guesstimate to be affected by something that we... Sure, yep. <laughs> That's here, man. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so yes, it, it, it would be hard to believe that we are going to avoid an economic cycle. They've, they've happened since the dawn of, of, of time. We know that economic cycles occur. Frankly, we were due for an economic cycle right around when COVID did, and based on federal funding, that, that kind of recession or market correction was averted. 
Um, I am with you. I think we are going to see something. How long, how severe is still obviously yet to be known. Um, the biggest risk that we have in our industry um, is obviously our revenue source. It, it's all based upon the assessed value of property. Right. We're still going to need our ambulance side of that. The side of the business is still going to operate as normally. Um, our, our wildland side of the business, I don't anticipate any issues on that side. There were still going to be wildfires that the, that the federal government is going to still have to fund to, to protect, to fight. Um, but where we could see is a decline in our assessed value. Um, and, and frankly, stuff like this capital plan, our, our savings, are those things that we have in place to help weather that type of so storm. So it's a fallback. Correct. Because again, while I agree we've got a healthy dollar amount and we're proposing, you know, 3.5 million sitting in that account at the end of this year, um, if there's an economic recession and we've got to pivot and we see a significant drop in our revenues, we could start planning and start pivoting and utilizing those monies for other needs to have a more of a soft landing versus an abrupt stop. I just want to make sure that anybody's listening, at least the people here, I mean, we can't be saying zippity doo -dah, um because of $3 million in the piggy bank. Correct. would agree with that. You're welcome. Um, so continuing down on, on our apparatus, um, the other item we have slated is for a water tender. Um, again, actually, I think water tenders aren't too bad on the supply chain right now. Um, maybe a year. <laughs> They're better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then some command staff vehicles as well as a telecom vehicle are, are some of the other items um, included in capital. We don't, for vehicles, we don't have any large engine purchases, although um, we do have one slated for next year. Um, so depending on, I do I say next year for 2025? So depending on kind of all these things we've discussed leading up to this, this may be something we bring to you sooner rather than later um, so we can at least get the process started on the build. Obviously with these long lead times and how well our, our money is doing essentially in the county, I wouldn't recommend any prepayments um, for the savings. Obviously there's a discount if we prepay, but I have a hard time getting saying we're gonna write a check for a million dollars and not see it for three years. Um, so but isn't that essentially what we just did with the purchase of the two previous fire engines? We bought two because yeah, it went a shorter build time as well. So we weren't we're not at where we're now pushing through. I've even heard this upwards of four years right now, uh, depending on the manufacturer. So. Okay. Well, with regard to not apparatus but vehicles, um, utility vehicles and so on and so forth that need to be replaced. I had a conversation with the fire chief with regard to the possibility of tagging on uh, to APS. Uh, and uh, I know that he is pursuing um, different options to do so, but rather than standing in line, uh, get in front of the line with larger um, purchasing agencies. Yes, exactly. That's, I mean, that's really at this point, you know, Chief, we had kind of the same conversation earlier today too. And, and frankly, you know, the dealers aren't interested in, you know, government one-offs because they're, they're, they're deeply discounted. There's not a lot of volume and we're in a market where, you know, they're getting to pick and choose the customer and not the other way around. And so I think something like that is definitely a viable way and it helps, will help us kind of control the cost um, by being part of a larger bulk purchase like that. Um, moving into our um, kind of equipment projects. Um, again, remember, you know, the telecom, all the telecom, there's a lot that needs to be done there, and all of that is still being looked at as part of a larger global telecom initiative. Um, so the only small thing in there is for some, uh, like, system upgrades. Um, but then really our, our other projects are logistics equipment. Uh, we've got some slated cardiac monitors, um, the breathing air compressor, so not the actual SCBA tanks, but a compressor that fills them, um, and then some rescue airbags. All in, uh, we have proposed capital expenditures of uh, 2.3 million, um, proposed capital funding of, and actually coming directly out of the capital fund would be 1.6 million. Um, and then we have funding of 1.4 coming from the general fund. One thing that's not in the budget that just so the board's aware of that will be coming at, at next year um, is 
out of the 20 million um, in ARPA funding that was set aside by the governor last year, that money has now been allocated out to the fire districts and a mechanism in place for us to apply for that money. Um, Sedona Fire has been allocated about 1.1 million of those funds. Uh, once we get through budget, we'll work with staff on putting together a plan to apply for that money for reimbursement. So it's reimbursement on our COVID expenses. Um, and that'll help give us another infusion because it's one time money would be an infusion of per capita levels. So. And, and we close the books on the uh, COVID overage that we had for as, as far as extra, extra funding. Correct. And that was okay. all allocated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, um, are there any questions on, on capital before we go back to the M&O budget? Okay, thank you. So this is that comparative page um, that the board that you all have in your packet. I just kind of want to start off again, let's just with some highlights on, on the budget for next year. Um, so off the off, off the front of it, we, we got our assessed value numbers in. We saw good growth. We saw 5.2% overall between both counties, which is good growth um, in, in comparison. Um, however, remember, if you remember from some previous budget workshops, inflation for, for the, the Arizona was at 8.5. So again, using our, our standard funding formula, if we just look at and rely on assessed value growth, that's not keeping up with, with just even the inflationary increases that we've seen over the years. Um, and so um, while it was nice to have that, that big revenue growth, it's still not quite enough to keep up. Um, we are proposing, again, depending on the scenario, different tax rates. And so I'll kind of, we'll finish up on those after I talk about the other pieces of the budget. Um, most of our non-levy revenues were held flat to this current year. Um, we did increase wildlands. Um, and that was being driven by our historical performance in wildland. We're still relatively conservative. I think Chief Coyle can talk to it a little bit more than I can, but you may notice right now, based on the weather, the winters that we've had, um, we've not started deployments at this point this year, whereas last year we'd already started deployments at this point. And so that will have an impact um, on, our, on our wildland revenue. Um, however, again, I want to remind the board that we're not balancing our budget on wildland revenue. So if we get wildland deployments, that helps bolster our capital funding. If we don't see the deployments, it does not impact day-to-day -day operations. Um, in addition, we've added more funding under our other income for Prop 207, um, and we've increased that to 210,000. Again, basing that off of kind of where we've seen the performance going on that overall over the last couple of years. Again, hoping uh, people still uh, still like to recreate. Uh, <laughs> so job secure. Yes, exactly. Um, on the expenditure side, uh, we do have a couple of different scenarios for payroll costs. So before I talk about the different scenarios, all in all, um, we did see an increase in our pension costs for next year. Uh, PSPRS went up to 46 <laughs> percent. Um, all the scenarios include um, rank for rank on our back bill for overtime. Um, we did see a 6% increase in health insurance, um, but for the first time in a while, our workers comp as a, as a percentage went down. Our cost overall for workers comp went up a little bit, but that's because of the underlying wage base going up, but our actual cost per, per dollar of wage went down from what we've seen in years past. So. Um, some good news there on that front. Um, looking at other operational expenditures, for the most part, a lot of this budget is based on maintaining what we're doing today. Um, we did see a large increase um, of, amongst some categories due to just due to inflationary cost increase. Um, PPE is an example of that area. Um, station supplies is another weird example of an increase in, in, uh, in um, inflationary cost, but that's something that we've seen um, across the state with our clients. Uh, in addition to that, we've added more funding um, in our HR budget for um, investigations, for employee-related matters, um, to really kind of address what some of the things we've been experiencing more and more that we've not really allocated enough funding for in the past. 
the one good news on our budget is we looked back last year, um, you know, based on the economic data that we had at the time, um, we, we believed our fuel costs were going to increase even more than what we did realize. Uh, so for next year's budget, we're actually able to kind of take that down a bit and, and lower that cost um, for, for next year's budget and still believe we've left ourselves, you know, enough capacity to, to meet the needs on a fuel cost standpoint. Uh, we do have the payoff on, on station six that occurred this year. So that debt service is now, has now been eliminated from our budget. Um, and then finally, kind of going back to, to the personnel side, We've kind of got three different personnel costs um, presented and essentially wanted to have the board with, you know, staff recommended, a low range, and a high range. Um, so option one is a 6% COLA. In, as I mentioned, all three include the rank for rank and a 6% drop incentive. Option two is a 4.6 COLA in rank for rank. And then find, and as well as it does include the drop incentive as well. And then option three is kind of the high one, which is the 8.7% COLA. It does still include rank for rank, but the 6% drop incentive is not included. Um, and so with that. That's different than what's on here. Yes. I, yeah, I apologize for that. Yeah. Can you clarify that? Yeah, the only thing that's in there is option two should include the drop percentages, uh, drop incentive as well. Okay. And option yeah. three shouldn't have it. Right. Jo option three says no. It says incentive. no on there. Yeah. That, I'm yeah. looking at this and it still says this one drops no drop or right. Right. It says no. No drop incentive. Right. That's correct. So underline yeah. no for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I did. And option two was with the 6%. Correct. Option, option two still includes the 6%. So basically one and two, we, we still have, every option has the rank for rank. That is static across all three. Um, one and two has a drop incentive, but different COLA is a 6% and a 4.6. And then option three is the 8.7 COLA with no drop. So kind of that offset. And when you say rank for rank, it means specifically what? Like, <clears throat> If I may, um, so backtracking for a minute, you know, when talking to JBG, I asked to present three ranges just to give an idea of what that looks like. Um, the, the only exception to these options is la labor, the, our firefighters labor group is, is asked to consider 7% COLA with the rank for rank and the 6% drop incentive. But, um, <clears throat> to answer your question, rank for rank is essentially the first the first ranked individual uh, battalion chief captain engineer that is off will be filled rank for rank, which is um, will generate overtime. But <clears throat> we believe, based on the data from the past numbers, it's going to reduce our potential for mandatory overtime because um, how that works without rank for rank is you just start trickling people up from the bottom that have, have done a task book. And so you guys have heard the term, you know, we have four drops or three drops. So those are people that on a perfect day, we have a, a fully staffed engine at, at per NFPA uh, with four. And rarely does that happen because those drops are utilized to reduce overtime. And what this does with rank for ranking, just the first position of each of those ranks, it creates an environment where those drops linger a bit longer before they're utilized, and it gives us the potential to not have those last-minute sick calls or emergencies where we have to mandatory somebody. And um, in addition to that, uh, we're in, we're in an environment right now where you know all our battalion chiefs are going to be new, newly promoted. A good handful of our captains are going to be newly promoted and, and engineers, and so. The other thought process with this is, is one, getting those ranked individuals in there to, to help season our folks. And two, as we're working to season more folks, we have ranked individuals more often to coach and counsel those folks that are working on completing task books. And, and so from a management standpoint, that's why um, when negotiating rank for rank, and, and we've discussed this for many years, and I, I think we're at a point where, where it, 
would add value to how we staff and how we operate and prepare for the future. And it's and it's been on the list with labor for many years. So that's essentially rank for rank. Just for clarification again, for maybe those who may not be that familiar with it, if a higher ranking individual works down because of a vacancy that exists and they're willing to work, they would be paid at their they would be paid at their current rate and not take a cut and pay to work. And by the same token, if there aren't any uh, ranked members you fill from the bottom up, they don't get bonus, they're just getting their straight pay. They, the, those that move up get a, a small stipend within its cents on the dollar. And uh, <clears throat> that's a great, great point. And when we get in this environment where we have these last minute sick calls or, or an emergency where we have to fill a lot of times to avoid a mandatory overtime where we force somebody to stay. Uh, we'll have a captain that says, oh, I'll jump on the ambulance. And from an efficiency standpoint and from a fiscal standpoint, that's not ideal. And and I I can't sit here and tell you I can prove that we will that will be less frequent, but based on some of the data sets we've run, by allowing these drops to be utilized later in the in the backfill, you know, continuum, uh, the potential for captains jumping in last minute to fill a firefighter spot potentially will be reduced, and we'll be analyzing that as part of this rollout if approved. Thank you, Gabe. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, thank you. So, with that, um, questions, comments from the board. The 6% drop incentive. Can you explain that to me, please? I, 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 so <clears throat> again, this has a management and labor piece. So th this is, this is a benefit that we had a few years ago and it went away. And the simplest way I can describe it, because Gabe helped me bring it down to normal people talk. Uh, for the sake of argument, we have a, an employee making a hundred thousand dollars a year. Our pension liability is an additional 46% to that, as Gabe stated with the PS Paris liability. When somebody enters the drop program, our costs as a district are reduced by 46%. So we no longer pay that into that pension system for that drop employee. So essentially we recognize the savings per person in the drop. Now, what labor has asked is that we bring back the drop incentive and to what we had in the past for those in the drop and essentially it's a six percent up to a six percent match requirement into a deferred compensation program now that's you know it's labor it's an incentive for people to enter the drop and to stay in the drop for the five years that's allowed and it it's a it's a benefit you know it's a it's a wage benefit now from a management standpoint um since we got rid of the program, we haven't had anybody stay in the drop for the five years. They leave early. And for example, um, we have a captain that's retiring in a couple weeks that had intended to stay for another year and a half. So then we, what we had planned for a captain's list and promotions and, and, and future planning changed by a year and a half and, and required some shifts because it was an unplanned exit. And so the thought process from a management standpoint is, uh, as folks reach the point where they can enter the drop program, th this will better help us forecast our future promotional needs and and there is a reduction in cost. And so, like I said, with with a $100,000 employee times say five people are in the drop, we, we, we'd recognize a wage savings of a little over $200,000. So, or at or around 200,000. So going forward, if we have multiple people enter the drop, the incentive is there to stay the five years so we can season replacements and do our testing processes. And then beyond that, uh, in future years, as people enter the drop, we'll have the potential to recognize wage savings and, and those those dollars can be allocated or go into general, or go into capital or reduce the mill rate. However, it's chosen in years to come, depending on how many people are in the drop, it, it it's advantageous for us. Chief, is this is this drop incentive 
for the duration of this of this budget, or is it something that we're going to have to talk about this every fiscal budget? It, it would be a, a change in our benefits package. So it, uh, unless addressed in future years, it would just it, it'd be like a change to health care or you know any of uh, any of our other benefits package. Right on, based on this one contract. And so essentially, <clears throat> folks are going to enter the drop. Um, the thought is we incentivize them to stay the full five years to give us more bandwidth to plan for retirements and and promotions. And there is a there is a cost reduction in payroll to the district by people going into the drop. It, what those are those are some of the management and labor. Um, Cited upon benefits, if you will, of the program. I have a question. All right, I hope this doesn't become too tedious. Um, how do people enter the drop incentive? What requirements are? How, how do they enter the drop? Yeah. It, so essentially, they, they submit documentation to the public safety retirement system and state that they are retiring and entering the deferred retirement option program. And then by statute, a clock starts and they can, can't can work more than five years, comma. Last year they added a two-year additional rider, but that wouldn't apply to to this scenario. And, and it's, it's that's a whole nother conversation and it's a reduced percentage and everything else. But essentially a member declares intent to retire the Deferred Retirement Option Program came into play, Gabe, in 15 years ago. Yeah. And uh, it was driven by the law enforcement associations because um, everybody was leaving. And we're, we're back there again. We're, we're seeing a lot of the fire departments and districts in Arizona really grew in the early 2000s. And we're at a reset point where we're in the same boat again. So um, that, that's essentially how the drop program works. So if I retire... April 1, and I announced that, fell out the paperwork with PRPS, uh, then um, I have five years. I can work an additional five years beyond my retirement date. Correct. And based on one of these options, I have here, my retirement, my, my res that adds to my retirement is a number of years? No. You, 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 if you do 20 years and you drop, you're, you're set at the 50% pension rate. If you do 25, you know, but no, you, you don't accrue any more percentage. You, you, you just say, I'm going to stay for an additional five. You're just getting salary. Yeah. But, but what this incentive is would be, you would get, you would get your salary, but so we're no longer contributing the 46% to PSPRS. What we would say is if you then contributed to a deferred comp plan, like a 457, or a 401A plan, we would match up to 6% of that contribution. Pretty cool. So we're saving 40% by you going into the drop, we're still gonna pay 6% and, if you contribute. And and like I said, this isn't, this this was a program we had in the past and uh, mm -hmm. labor's ask is that we bring it back uh, with our current environment. Thank you. Okay, anything else? That's the whole workshop. I need to think about going back and not retiring. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the issue we're having is the retirement's looking really good to our essentially our entire senior staff, and so we're looking at ways to, for, as stated in previous board meetings, re, not only recruitment but retention. Gabe, I actually do have a question for you. Yeah. Is there the hard part for me, and I apologize for this, but were there any other areas that were significantly changed in this budget from the last budget that we saw to get these estimates? No, the only changes from the last full budget when you guys had the meeting with Sarah is on the personnel side. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Everything else has stayed the same. I did notice that everything except the personal costs pretty much stayed the same. And I was kind of kind of surprised in that, you know, when 
we want to look at numbers with an increase in salaries because of COLA, you would ex think or expect to see cuts across the board somewhere that would affect everybody. When in fact, everything stayed the same, but we went to these hidden costs, if you will, uh, the drop incentive uh, that affects us differently, just a different way of thinking, which is unique because we don't, traditionally we don't, we didn't do this. You know, we were used to the exercises of, let's exercise, do an exercise of 5% and a 10% cut across the board and see what the numbers look like. I mean, that's just, maybe that's old school. Yeah. Maybe some jurisdictions still do that. Well, and I, I think it, and, and I may be speaking out of turn, but I think it speaks to the, to the work our program managers put into, I mean, in, when I, when I started working with our budget, the, the mantra was ask for X percent more because they're going to cut it. And our, our program managers really come to us with really tight, constricted numbers and, and working with JVG over the past few years, you know, we, we had this mentality like, Oh shoot, band-aids cost more. I'm going to be over $4,000. And no, there's a mechanism to accommodate for that. But whereas before when we budgeted, we would add, 4,000 at the front end worried that we might be short on the back end, but we, we budget in such a way that we can make up those emergencies, if you will. And uh, in, in, in addition to that, I, I think we have an appropriate, you know, mechanism to fund capital because while some of the station projects and the radio products are at the point where we're really starting to get numbers now that, those numbers are going to come in and come in quick and we'll be in a, in a spot to take advantage of, you know, good interest rates or good construction costs instead of saying, shoot, now we have an idea we got to save for it. And that that's kind of born out of, out of our, our post bond years where, you know, we, we identified these needs and the bond wasn't approved. So the board at the time and, and has continued to create an environment where we're saving for that rainy day and that opportunity. I'm also looking at on this difference between option one and two that of a $23 million plus budget, the difference between the two is essentially a $500,000 difference and a change in the mill rate of seven cents, which is I think below what we've, the last couple of years, what they've been climbing. How is that going to affect the mill rate for subsequent years coming down? Are we going to see bigger jumps, even though you have the schedule to make up for lost ground or? Yeah, so I, again, I, again, barring what we've seen these last two years with record inflation, I think we're going to get back to a more smoother increase in our mill rate over the next few years. The, the issue that we have coming is what happens on the assessed value side. So. With Prop 117, what it did is it took us from the full cash value to the limited property value. The full cash value has grown significantly over these last couple of years, while limited property value has only grown at 5%. Theoretically, we should still see our limited property value continue to grow, even though that full cash value may start to decline in, in, a, in a recession until they meet. Um, assuming that happens, we, we would hopefully see kind of a smooth landing um, on some of this. But again, it could cause us to have to make a larger adjustment in our in our tax rate if we see a significant decline in such a. Okay, we're well, I think we're at the point then. If there aren't any other questions, is that you got to make a decision about the compounding? Is that uh, I think we're at that point, if there aren't any more questions, that we now need to give direction to the chief and first staff to figure out which which one of these options we should pursue, options one, two, or three. And Mr. Chair, if I may reiterate the fact that <clears throat> these options were, were presented as kind of a low, high, mid-range, just I, I felt that if we went percent by percent from four to 8.7, it would, it would clutter the page. And uh, it, it, would, it would just be a lot of numbers. And so our, our labor group um, has has asked for 7%. And, and 
I, I want to make that clear that I explained that because it, and the reason it didn't reflect it on here is because I, like I said, I didn't want to clutter the page and I wanted to give a small, medium, large, if you will. Gabe, can you talk about the compounding impact? Because I think that's important for the board to consider too. Yeah. So, you know, Chairman Soto, kind of in along your question of the impact of the tax rate going forward and what that looks like. Understand, you know, our, our wage increases, our personnel costs, I mean, not only one is it the largest percentage of our budget. So obviously small percentage changes in that line item have larger impacts on the budget. Like a good example is going from the six to the seven percent is about a five cent tax increase, you know, from what you're seeing. <clears throat> At 267. Mm -hmm. So if we went to 7% goal, we'd be we'd be closer to like 272 on the tax rate. So just seeing that 1% increase, that impact. But what Chief Coyle's kind of talking about is that compounding effect of, of rate of higher percentage raises. So once we, you know, if we if we have you know a million dollars, okay, and we raise that five percent, um, you know, now we're talking, you know, one million um, you know, fifty thousand. If we go up, um, then in the following year, that same 5% is no longer 50,000, that 5% is more. And so the higher the base number that we have, um, the more that compounding effect is down the road. And so that's something to think about too, when you think about kind of the long-term effect of these. You know, you go for the larger we increase that number, that percentage, that percentage will compound as we, as we go into future years. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gabe, but that is in contrast to the the, the drop incentive, where it yeah it's it's fixed, and then if you if we decide if you decide hey we're gonna you can sunset that and not let anybody else get in at a certain date, you know, that that is easier done than rolling back wages. Correct. Once the wages are set at a certain rate, that's the rate that we have to live with going forward. Whereas something like an incentive or a benefit like that is a benefit that can be added or, or deleted over time. If we look at <clears throat> understanding what you just said here, and, and and these options are such that the first option one is six. If we state anything higher than six, but less than option three, and it's higher, but not as high as what labor wants. Is there still, I mean, your ability to negotiate is then handicapped? I, well, because my brain's small. Um, for, for the sake of conversation, labor hasn't asked, right? 7% and with the, with the other, other benefit changes. But they may be listening. Huh? They may be listening. Of course. And, 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 I, and I, I'm, I'm sure they are, and I, I appreciate their position. Um, but the board adopts and approves the budget. So my, my job is to present to you, you know, the work we've put into developing the budget. You, you make the ultimate decision. And, and in whatever direction you, you do or do not give tonight, then we're, we're still in a period of negotiation. So there's opportunity for more conversation. But um, if tentatively adopted tonight, the, the board will set the top, as you know, and and so wherever that top lands is is where I go back to the table with labor. Do you have room for negotiation at the other end, depending on what we decide tonight? I I, I believe we have a conscientious professional group of folks that work here, and uh, with explanation, they they will seek to understand. Where, where the board lands with their decision, and, I, and that is my job to help communicate that. And at the end of the day, um, if I understand your question correctly, it, yes, we're still finalizing negotiations, um, but I wanted to be, you know, full clear text to you on what the asks are. And then you know, once given direction, I can go back to the labor groups and finalize everything. If, if something else you may want to consider as you're evaluating these choices is that We've already went done the outreach to do a comprehensive um, total compensation study. We deliberately delayed that until after July 1 because the amount of COLAs that agencies are giving is there's a, a broad spectrum. And so for us to be able to evaluate the competitiveness of our total package, 
Um, we want to wait until after July 1. So if a decision made here that that causes us to be not competitive, which frankly, I don't think any of those, uh, any of the ones up there would, we, we will have that information um, and it will be pretty fresh by the next budget cycle. So we'll know how we stand. Based on that, then across the board, is the trend closer to options one, two, or three? I don't so, know. yeah, so I, I was telling the chief we could actually start doing our own little wage studies now with all the clients we have now. <laughs> um, but um, the I would say the average we're seeing across across the board with our clientele is a 5% COLA. Um, and, and that's, you know, there's some that are going, you know, higher. There's some that are doing the 8.7, um, but there's some that are doing a 2% COLA or no COLA. Um, and so it's, I would say 5%, it's about where the average is at. But don't we also have to look at where our salaries are in comparison with everybody else's anyway? Correct. We just can't look at the COLA. Correct. So. Okay, well, with that, um, and in order to give chief direction, we have three options in front of us. Is there any one of those three that you want to throw out? Toss that, out? Toss out that you want to. I, I will toss out option one. And the reason I'll toss out option one is because I think that we have historically delivered a 4.6% COLA. Um, or not, sorry, we just moved, sorry, my apologies. We've historically matched Social Security which is at 8.7%. So we also know things have quieted down a little bit economically since the 8.7%. If the average that uh, JVG is seeing is 5% and the, the uh, union is asking for 6%, or sorry, 7%, I think for me, the 6% is a perfect middle ground for us. Um, and it treats our employees fairly in a time when we want to retain them. And I thought you said you were going to toss out. I think she meant. No, no, no I, sorry. You want to keep one? I want to keep. I, I'm. <laughs> I'm. You asked me to toss. I did. Sorry. Which, which one do you want to toss out? I'm mean, toss, toss out as far as get rid of. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I misunderstood. <laughs> I'm a little loopy today. Okay. What can I, I say? Uh, I, I would sorry, say that. Yeah, I'm loopy. I would. I would discard or, or toss out or not consider. To me, it would be option number three. That was me. Oh, I agree. And I'm two. Okay, yeah. then. How about Helen? You're. And I'm. So I'm. Toss out option three. Okay. Um, okay. I'm, okay. I'm tossing out option two. Okay. Jean? Well, I, I tend to agree. I definitely uh, would toss out option three. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that place is sort of middle ground between six and the 4.6. Okay. Scott? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, what? Scott, would you have? Which was the one that you would just do away with? Do they have to be these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are the ones we're presenting. Take this here and then say 7%. They don't offer a 7% here. I could give you guys that number. If that's the board's wish, we can give you that number so you can make the motion. So what you're saying is one and two. Would be one and two would be tossed, and you'd be leaning towards three, but make it seven percent. Is that what you're saying? No, that's coming down. <laughs> I'm just I'm asking. <laughs> well, we can't go higher if right. we adopt it. We can go uh, lower. Mr. Chair, I, b I believe he's indicating option one with a modification to seven percent. Okay, if that's uh, what I'm saying. Yeah, and, and, and I, I want to remind the board that this isn't this is your whatever you vote on is your top. And next month you could come back and say, we, you know, we've thought about it some more. And but this this sets a top cap, right? So you're saying you, one is the one you want to keep with a modifier of a seven percent? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So which is the worst one then? The worst one you just don't want to even look at anymore? Well, given what I'm finding out here, yeah, I would say drop three. Drop three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so basically, as a consensus. Based on these options that we have here, it looks like number option number three was, is one that we would no longer have on the table. Okay. 
it looks like option one and two. Um, only option, only one person on option two chose not to keep that. So it, and one person mentioned option number one to keep, but with a modifier up to 7%, right? I think that's where yes. we're at. Okay. Um, let me ask you, okay, let's say it's 7%. The benefit will be the benefit. Would the benefit be, you know, we're we're competitive with, with uh, our uh, seeking employees and what have you, and so on. Is that a benefit? In in uh, yeah, I think if I understand your question correctly, talking about like if it is the cost proportionate with the um, with the added incentive that creates for either more work, retaining anything else that you're measuring that by. Uh, I think, well, from, I could answer this because from an organizational psychology perspective, compensation needs to be commensurate with. It, ideally, if your compensation, if you're a, a, what they call an employer of, um, oh, I forgot the term, a, a, there's like a, an employee of excellence, but if it's above roughly about the 65% or 65% of the mean, so in the upper third, then you feel fairly compensated. Um, when people fall below the median, then they feel like they are unfairly compensated for the work they're doing. And so that is usually the biggest effect that pay has. Um, morale, working conditions, you know, how much autonomy you give people. There's all sorts of other factors that have more weight. So it is certainly not a one-to-one -one for every bit of pay increase you get above those, that relevance factor for people to feel more incentivized. And Mr. McCarthy, that's a, that's a conversation I would definitely intend to have with laborers is, is you know, re circle back and, and discuss these things. Uh, Chief, what I'm what I'm looking at here is is probably the perfect agreement would be an agreement where nobody agrees. There, there can't be a true winner. I mean, uh, if I got what I wanted, labor would be unhappy, and if labor got what they wanted, I would be unhappy. So I think Scott brought up a, a legitimate uh, scenario that if we went with option number one, with the modifier not at 7%, because that's what labor would want. And this quote six, why not look at 6.5? It gives you room to negotiate. It gives them to, to negotiate. I think that's a middle ground that we could look at that would meet the needs of the budget, meet the needs of labor, meet the needs of the taxpayer out there as far as what they're going to be giving up. And the scenario based on per cent of mill rate increase to get to that. That's about a two, it's two cents. A two cents increase. Okay. Then. Would it be correct? Two, six, nine? It would actually, it'd actually be two, seven, zero, three, zero. It's a little bit more than two cents. Okay. So with that, Bill, is it a motion or just a consensus for direction on this? Uh, Get a motion. So, was there any so let me give you. So, so essentially, the motion, Mr. Chair, would be uh, totally adopt the fiscal year 24 budget mm -hmm. of 23 million 842,812 dollars at a tax rate of two dollars, actually two seven zero three zero. And I just. Mr. Chair, I want to remind if, if there was any other any other option beyond that one, it, it, this is the the final cap decision, and it could come down next month. Yeah, but it, it gives it gives us room to negotiate without. I mean, we're, we're showing our hands, but I mean, at least we're we're meeting a middle ground. No, I com I completely understand. So, okay. With that said, then uh, I make a motion to adopt the tentative. Budget at twenty three million eight hundred and forty two thousand eight hundred and twelve dollars at a mill rate of two point seven zero three zero for fiscal year twenty twenty four. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the tentative of budget. The tentative 
The motion has carried to approve the tentative budget as stated. Uh, so as always, let's work in a downward rate if we can, but if that's what the numbers are, that's what the numbers will be. And, and you have my commitment over the next month prior to the next board meeting, we'll continue to look at options and opportunities. Uh, like Gabe spoke to, the, the ARPA funding, while coming much slower than expected, is, is coming in at 1.1, and, and there's some opportunities there, and, and it'll help us evaluate future capital expenditures and needs and things like that. And so we never stop looking at it. Very good. Well, we got past that one. Thank you very much for all your work. Thank you, staff, for, uh, for that, as well as finance. Um, hopefully, we can just make the next, this next month happen without, without incident. Okay, with that said, that concludes our workshop for uh, this, the budget workshop for fiscal year 2024, and we can move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, Actually, it would be the presentation of awards and staff recognition. Yes. Let's knock that out of the way so we can. Yes, sir. It's not important. It is important, but don't get the things too. Completely understood. None of, none of the none of the members uh, were able to make it tonight, and you know, look, thinking in my mind, I can see the faces of these guys, and I can't believe they've been here five years already. Um, it's it's shocking to me. Um, <clears throat> first one up there, we're recognizing for five years of dedicated employment is is. Uh, Jose Diaz. Uh, he was hired in 18, uh, May of 18, like the rest of these folks, as a firefighter EMT, and then he went to medic school in 2022, and he's been out supporting our medic fleet. Uh, <clears throat> he's got an associate's degree from the Community College of the Air Force, an associate's degree in fire science, and then in, he's also obtained his bachelor's degree in exercise and wellness, and uh, he served from 20... 2004 to 2010 in the U.S. Air Force as a combat controller. Um, Sandeep Grewal, again hired in May of 18, um, received a unit citation in 2018, and he's got a bachelor's of science from University of California, Irvine, for public health science. And then lastly is, is Mark Feeney, <clears throat> hired as a, an EMT in 2018, and uh, also in 2018, he got a unit citation. In 2020, he got the Community Service Award for working with Toys for Tots. He got the same award again in 2021. And Mock is, uh, I just want to say the university because I can't pronounce it. He got a Bachelor's of Primary Education from the University of Wollongong um, in Australia. And uh, he also got a Bachelor's in Primary Teaching from uh, another Australian university. He is one of our imports. And uh, these are all great folks, uh, up and comers. They've all contributed. You know, Mark contributes to a lot of our alternate exercise programs and, and fitness stuff. Uh, Jose, same thing. And and Sandy, he's he's our special kid. He uh, he actually, if you've seen the promotional video, the Sedona Fire video on our website, uh, he produced it and uh, filmed and produced it. So he's got some skills. So they're they're all very talented guys. And like I said, I'm. I can't believe it's already been five years. Well, on behalf of the, the fire board, uh, congratulations on their, their recognition of five years of service. Um, does that make them all vested now based on their benefits and all that? Their money back. At five years at the mark? I, I would have to research that because of all the tiers and public safety, some of the tier three B, Q, and, and you know, there, there's so many things, but yeah, yeah, but uh, no, it's, it's. I remember all three of them when they came on board, and you kind of just wait to see when they're going to make their mark. And uh, and like you mentioned, Mark Feeney has already made his his mark uh, around, and the others uh, are probably in, in route to doing so the same. So yeah, we'll look forward to the tenure. So congratulations, to all all three of them. So thank them for us. Okay. Uh, with that said, that leads us to uh, the next item on our agenda, um, and we're going to go right down to executive session. Um, that's a possible vote to go into executive session for legal advice in reference to citizen code enforcement letter pursuant to ARS 38-431.03A3 uh, legal advice. Uh, with that said, um, do I have a second? Second. I almost forgot that. Uh, any further discussion? <coughs> Favor? 
Aye. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> okay, we are now in executive session. We're upstairs. Where are we going? One upstairs. Yeah, I guess this, we should wrap this up in a moment. They get old. I can't even change the phone. Kim, you want me to steer so you can take notes? Okay. All set? Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Everybody's here but Bill? Okay. Okay, we are now back in public session. Um, as a result of being an executive session, uh, in reference to the citizen concern relating to code enforcement issues, uh, I'd like to direct the chief to uh, create a communication back to the individual uh, citizen, uh, describing those items discussed in executive session uh, and encouraging uh, the citizen that we look forward to working with him and, and becoming uh, and working with him and going through the process uh, in order for him to achieve his ultimate goal of building his home where he's selected to build it. Understood. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> regular business meeting, regular meeting business, I should say. Uh, Chief, do we have anybody from the public wishing to talk? I do not. Consent agenda consists of the April 18th regular meeting minutes and the April 26, 2023 special meeting minutes. Uh, do I have, uh, I'll make the motion to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Okay, consent agenda is approved. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is the financial report and updates from Director of Finance, Gabe Boulder. All right, well, uh, good afternoon or good evening now, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, you have the April financial report in your packet. Starting off uh, revenue for the month, uh, you'll see our tax levy revenue is at uh, 3.7 million uh, for the month of April. That was uh, 423,000 over what we had projected for the month. Uh, Non-levy revenue was at 226,000. Uh, we were under budget by 20000 One of the predominant drivers was our ambulance revenue. However, it's just more of a function on timing for the month here today. We're actually still looking right in line with the budget. Um, on the expenses, uh, total expenses for April were $1,574,447. We were under budget in totality of our expenses by about $13,809. A uh, couple variances to point out. Um, uh, communication uh, was over budget by 7,500 for some network uh, switches that were installed, as well as meeting, travel, and training was over budget by $7,300, uh, and that was due to uh, some uh, ropes training and some technical rescue training that was expended in the month. Um, going on to the next slide here today. Here today, uh, total revenues at $20,438,000. $844. Uh, that is over budget by $760,000. Uh, property tax collection makes up about $200,000 of that variance. Um, our non levy revenues make up about $560,000 of that variance. Um, the predominant driver is our wildland revenue uh, being over budget, as I mentioned before. Ambulance revenues got right in line with budget. Um, and then obviously, the, the positive side to the Fed rate increases is our interest earnings. Um, we're at 236,000 already through April, which is actually 175,000 over what we budgeted for the uh, for the year. Um, expenses total expenses are at 16 million uh, 250,550 dollars, uh, which is over budget by 104,000. So, and as you can see, we're kind of under a budget across all major categories, uh, with the exception of a small variance on our communication and IT expenses. Um, as far as percentage of expenses, um, we have, um, you can see we have 18% of the budget remaining. 
uh, with 72% uh, expended uh, through the month of April. So we're still, again, that's reflective of us being under budget on our total expenses. As far as the breakdown, as kind of mentioned in the budget process, the per personnel being our highest expense, 85%. Uh, operational expenses make up 7% of the total budget. Uh, communications are five and uh, managerial expenses are 3%. And then finally, year over year, you'll see we have the month with uh, 16.4 million total cash on hand compared to 15.99 last year at the same time. So an increase of about 426,000. Our other assets did increase from 22.7 uh, to 25.6 million. Uh, the big driver of that um, is twofold. One, our investment in capital assets, so new assets we've, we've acquired over the year, um, as well as some of our um, year-end adjustments that we do on our pension assets and liabilities drove those, that increase in assets to the tune of about $600,000. Hmm. Um, total liabilities did increase from, oh, <laughs> uh, from $31.1 million uh, to $32.5 million. Um, again, looking back, one of those big drivers is some of those, those actuarial, those pension adjustments um, based on the, the actuarial reports that we record at year end. But if we look at our true liabilities, you know, long-term debt, things of that nature, we're obviously paying off that lease purchase and pay down those actual, li you know, current liabilities, so to speak. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Do you have any questions for uh, Gabe? This is one of those rare months where we don't have questions for you. Also, <laughs> two hours into the meeting, huh? So, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just a testament. It's a testament to our, our long-range planning and, and, and having really, it really is a long-range planning and seeing that even though our liabilities went up a little bit, we had a pretty good jump in in our cash on hand and um, our other assets. So, yeah. thank you for that. With thank that, you. with that said. Um, I'll go ahead and move to approve the April 2023 finance report as uh, as stated. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Further uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The April 2023 finance report is approved as presented. Next item on the agenda is the staff items, which would be the fire chief's report. Chief Mazoulis. Okay, uh, we'll be covering Heidi's report. Uh, she had to leave for a family event. Okay. Um, I'm going to stand up. <laughs> Been sitting too long. Gotcha. Um, so I have a collaboration update. Uh, our administrative staff's been meeting and working on conflict oh. resolution and, and just kind of right-sizing and, and developing uh, some, some different task-oriented approaches to things. And they're working on a task book for cross-training and, and really tuning up how, how everything's interwoven. Um, Thank you. And we had our uh, our Firewise Clean Boat event. Dory, you gonna talk a little bit about that? And then the Verde Valley Fair. It was a successful fair. The bakers once again won everything. And uh, <laughs> besides my five-year-old who got a trophy for her goat show, and she thinks she won the fair. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it was. It was pretty cool. Um, as you know, we've got the awards ceremony coming up May 19th and uh, Administrative Professionals Training Day, May 23rd. I'm excited about this. So the Arizona Fire District Association recognized that the focus of the fire training was for the chiefs and the ops stuff and all that. And over the past couple of years, they've done a collaborative effort to develop opportunities to, for administrative, the, the folks behind the scenes that, that make everything happen, um, an environment for them to kind of, you know, commiserate and collaborate and, and kind of learn, hey, who, you know, there's a lot of repeat work because we're inventing a process that CAFO may already has. You know, for example, our task books we reached out to them. They said, here's five of our completed task books, gave us a six month jump on developing ours. So the, the this training is being hosted at CAFA and a majority of our administrative staff's going and they're going to cover a lot of the things that we do with cross training and how they're developing cross training for their staff, how they do wildland building and process improvements to that. And it's just an environment where they, they can get together and 
better to find how things look and how they work around fire districts around the state and then and create an environment where administrative function is more aligned and there's a, a lot of benefits to that so I'm, I'm excited about it um firefighter recruitment update as of last week uh, we had 26 applications for our firefighter recruitment and um, we'll get another update this thursday and it closes in june so we'll see uh, those numbers are lower than i want but they reflect what we're seeing across the state right now i mean literally not literally but everybody's hiring not everybody but everybody and uh, yeah I, it's and now we're going we're doing some social media battling back and forth with each other and having some fun with that and uh so it, it's interesting it's a new world and then we've got a, a resi we had a resignation in administration and uh my direction to director robinson is before we jump to fill it we're going to complete our task book and our evaluation process of of our wants and needs within our administrative functions and and make sure that we're filling a position for the our needs not because we had a position that was defined in such a way. Because some things have changed in administration and uh, Gabe's realigned, for example, some processes with finance that simplifies a lot of things. And there's some other things we've done to simplify process and we're gonna look for opportunities to uh, make sure that position is the right position if it's the position we need to have. So that's ongoing. And then <clears throat> other staff stuff, you know, with tenant approval of the budget and the conversations in the past couple of board meetings, we we have identified uh, two chief officers that will be moving to a 40-hour week position and assuming those training and, and support roles. And uh, next month will be badges everywhere because we're doing a lot of promotions to fill all those ranks. So, uh, and I'll get a deeper dive into what's going on with that next month um, with the folks here, so you can see their smiling faces. Uh, next slide, please. Well, all right. Significant events, a lot of hike outs. That was of all the things we did this month, those were the most um, the most frequent. And I'll let, I'm sure the training part, Chief Mazulis will cover when he does that part. Um, Wildland, so what's going on right now is that there is a high pressure over the Pacific Northwest that is a heat dome, basically. It was hotter today in Portland than it was in Phoenix. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, huh? And so um, that's good for us because it creates almost the same sort of flow out of the Gulf of Mexico that the monsoons do, just from a, a higher up system. It's terrible for the Pacific Northwest, terrible for Canada right now. Um, they they have, talking to some jumpers, they were, just tell them, find a fire and jump it. They don't even know, there's so many of them in Alberta and everything. They're trying Right, I can see if you can find a small one that you guys think you can get your arms around before it becomes another one of the big ones because they have so many huge fires. And they have their system. They've called for incident management teams from us, from Australia, and from New Zealand. And it was interesting. You could tell it wasn't a system they're used to using frequently because it has not performed very well over the last seven days. So um, for us, this weather is supposed to continue for at least another week. Uh, they're calling for below normal chances of, of large fires in our area and every place north of, north of here, all the way through June now. So it's, it's a big deal when we get a surge of moisture this time of year before everything starts to cure, because you can delay green up for like three weeks if we if we have this week to 10 days of really good weather, which, um, I mean, sorry, delay it starting to cure out, makes a big difference for the, the length and then the, the, the resistance to suppression of, the, of the, that we experienced in that peak part of our fire season. Um, so, so GIS, Spinelli, he messed up he, because he like created this product that was so awesome that he's going to get tasked with doing other products now. But it wasn't just, it wasn't just Spinelli. It was um, Brian Espial, Josh Clonch, and then Matt Spinelli. But you know, I told you about last week we asked him to look, or last month, beg your pardon, look at different products to communicate essential information, key performance indicators, everything on board. Well, Came back with a, they, they assessed five different products, came back with an objective assessment of each one of them, cost everything else, pros, cons, benefits. And I believe that based on the feedback that I've received and the, and the work that they've done, we have a demo on Monday, but that we should be able to provide each one of the stations with 
near real time key performance indicators when it comes to response times and everything. As long as the board, you know, there'll be like a screen in here that will have all that information on it. And so then we can shift our focus from the, the, the static periodic strategic planning that assumes that the environment is linear and that things are going to change a lot and assumes a lot of things that, frankly, we don't experience here in the next process to something that's more scenario planning based that will, um, it will most certainly improve the predictive value of, the, of our efforts. So you guys will get numbers that you can see. It'll be the same numbers that the crews can see. There'll be response times and everything else associated with it. And we will be able to use that to, to do some more still strategic level planning, but where it is more based on what we see as trends in, in shorter terms. So we don't have to assume that past long-term past performance is going to continue linear cost and everything else when that's just not what happens. That's, that's pretty cool. That's the, the big GIS thing. And I'd, I'd, well, I'd ahead, like Mike. to add, it's to wrap my head around it. It's, it's essentially, it, it's, it's utilizing hardware and technology to provide not only real time data on what's going on in our district, but also the ticker tape, you know, there'll, there'll be trailing items and, and updates and it'll just be a one-stop shop. And I believe that it's going to completely change how we report out to the board, not only are you going to have more access to the information regularly? It it will it will abbreviate the presentation and the explanation and, and afford you the opportunity to ask pointed questions and and nail down specifics in the board meeting and get the information you want. So I'm excited about it. And the cool thing is everybody's going to be operating off the same sheet of music, same numbers you see will be the same numbers the crews have access to right there at their, at their you know, kitchen table. So um, yeah, telecom. You know, there's of course, as always, Bob's got a whole list of things that he's working on, but the one I wanted to highlight, because it's relative to what we are just talking about with the strategic plan, is that he is taking one of the vendors around this week to look at all of our different sites to get a, a, a different a bid that is not the Motorola bid, that hopefully will be significantly less than the Motorola bid, to deal with uh, all the shortcomings that exist on our mountaintop sites. So increase, you know, increase their... Um, Dependability, increase their 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 ability to um, exchange things and their reliability. And um, Chief Mazoulis was with them in the initial meeting with them. Now they're up there at the mountaintop sites, going through all the stuff. We're excited about that. I'm excited about where that'll go, so we can make some progress towards getting that completed. You know, I, the the only, and uh, if this was a new thing, I apologize, but. The last thing I just want to tell the board is that, so we had the engineers assessment center and then we listed 12 of the 14 candidates, all 14 candidates within 42 days had one-on-one -on -one feedback sessions to go over all their feedback, find out how they did, where the areas were that they could improve. And then I um, gave them a specific to oral boards. There's some of them that I, I feel like they had some real light bulb moments about how they could better portray their, their skills and gave them some substantive things that they could work on so they could improve for the next process. So I felt, I felt good. It's a lot of work, but I felt good about that because it's making that test versus at one point in time, but it's a, it's a contributor to their long-term success. Great. End of report. <clears throat> All right. Dory. This past month we had done, we have done one home ignition zone assessment. Uh, 13 code consultations, um, 48 site inspections and 32 plans reviews. Um, Kirk has been doing an excellent job while I've been away, um, and as well as Carla holding down the fort. So I can't be, I was, I couldn't be more blessed with a great team to keep up the shop. Um, and I promise I'll try to keep Humpty, du Humpty Dumpty together for a while after this one. Um, <laughs> Uh, notable events, one of the things that we've been reporting on is the airport fuel farm. Tomorrow morning, Kirk, as well as the fire marshal from Copper Canyon, who's um, very versed in hazmat, they're going to be there with the um, aviation fuel team, as well as the construction team to begin the commissioning. Um, if all goes well tomorrow, they'll be adding fuel into all their fuel tanks, and uh, projects should be wrapping up in the near future. Um, so the the existing fuel farm will be decommissioned and that risk will be 
knocked down quite significantly of anything going wrong. Um, the end of last month, the beginning of this month, we had our 20th annual wildfire preparedness days. We actually are at about 25.5 tons, which is a record for um, all of the years that we've done it. We did move to the West Sedona out of Uptown, and we had a lot of great feedback about that. Um, next month, I'll have a complete roll up with the number of people that actually did visits and the hours that the community put forth towards um, making Sedona safer for the wildfire season. And then the safety message, kind of going along with Chief Coyle and our, our frequent events for the month were hike outs and trail rescues, um, is safe recreating. So knowing your physical limit abilities and recreate restrictions, proper footwear. We do have a lot of slick rock, and as Chief Coyle discussed with our weather, we've got some weather that's not normal for us right now. So a lot of wet rocks as well. Proper clothing, uh, layers, charged cell phone, at least in your group. That way, if you do have problems, you can somebody can at least get out to us. Stay on the trails that are marked on Forest Service maps. Uh, although the unofficial trails such as Subway Cave is um, very popular thanks to social media and other um, unendorsed books by the National Forest Service. It is not an endorsed trail. It's not marked for that reason or culturally sensitive items back there, as well as many of the other trails that are popular in nature but not on ma maps that are, can be obtained by the Forest Service. Um, be weather-wise. Keep an eye on the weather. Um, if you all the cell phones, for the most part, will have an alert, but if you're going to be out where you may not have cell phone service, weather radios are pretty cheap these days. They can pick up AM radio. Um, bring plenty of water and food and pack it in, pack it out, which leaves me at um, this weekend. Uh, the Leave No Trace program is actually going to be at the Crescent Moon Campground in Slide Rock to do some trail maintenance and talking about safe recreating as well as um, keeping our environment safe. Any questions? Good work. Good stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. You're back. Operational support. Um, <clears throat> we've done a ton of training. We continue to do a ton of training, wrapping up our wildfire refreshers, our technical rescue classes. Um, our last hire just hit their six months and uh, they all pass successfully. And then our new hires will start next week, the three new folks. So we're, we're pumping them out three at a time every six months lately. And um, <clears throat> I anticipate with the recently announced retirements that we're gonna be hosting a, a new hire academy in the fall. And uh, I anticipate that'll be done as soon as we get this new hire testing process over with. And uh, which doesn't close till June. So um, we, sh we should have a list established by August and schedule a, a September Academy. And, and again, I uh, want to be clear, we didn't add any positions in this budget. This is purely to fill vacancies. And so, um, and then other than that, yeah, we've just been prepping for the season. We can go to the next slide in the interest of time. And here's, here's my turn. So, gosh, those numbers are, as you can see, <clears throat> year over year, uh, today call totals were, were trending. Um, looking at that, we're, we're trending, we trended down a little bit last month, <clears throat> but I think that had to do with just kind of the, the spring break rush and then a little turn down and then I think we'll be up again this month. Next slide. <clears throat> And then responses by station are, seeing, are, are staying pretty steady. We're going to see that station five number jump in about another few weeks, and uh, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be getting their due. Yeah, please. And then there, here's our here's our uh, turnout times and, and the Chief Coyle's point. I, I appreciate what these numbers tell us, but in their in this static environment, and we'll. With the new system, we'll be in a position where we could do some month-over-month -month stuff a lot easier, and it'll it'll trend and, and be more real time, if you will. Um, this is an aggregate of last month, but you can see uh, dispatch notified times at 44 seconds, 
Mm-hmm. Our guys, the turnout time drops by about seven seconds over over last month, uh, eight seconds, and then travel times dropped down a little bit. And I I caution the anchor into travel time too much because there's so many variables we can't control, whether it's traffic, weather. It just could happen that all the calls are close to the station that month. So it's a, it's a relative indicator of performance. It, it's still our median total response time is still within the national average. And um, and to remind the board, this is one of the key performance indicators that we keep an eye on because if we trend year over year where that goes up to eight minutes, we'll evaluate, oh, it's because there's so many more calls in the village, we might need another ambulance. That's just a hypothetical. but. That, that's why these numbers matter to me because it it helps if I just come out of thin there we need another ambulance because I think we need one that that means nothing to this board but if I have data behind it it makes sense and then again my favorite stat is uh, reminding that our the 90th percentile of our ambulance road time is those calls are taking those ambulances two hours and 30 minutes outside of the station so um, when we talk about ambulance availability and a little hiccup like the cath lab is now once again out of service in Cottonwood for an again? unknown yeah for an unknown amount of time. So um, that matters because our cath lab patients have to be flown, which incurs additional cost for our, our community members, or they go to Flagstaff, which is an increased travel time. So um, watching this, this number is important to me too. If we have an increase of Phoenix or Flagstaff transports, and we're trending 90th percentile, our ambulances go from two hours and 30 minutes out of service for a call to three, four hours, and that changes how we, we respond and how we staff. So these these numbers are important, and um, we have no indication when they're going to uh, restaff the cath lab. It's purely on doctors coming in here. And they have improved their – we readjusted our stroke protocols, so we've, we've agreed to, when we have a stroke patient, get them to Cottonwood, our crews are going to take the extra time to rush them back to the, the scanning equipment versus putting them in a bed and having the hospital do all their muckety muck. We're saying, hey, we're going to beeline it to the CAT scan or the MRI and get these patients defined and you know, diagnosed sooner. So there are some things that, with other diagnoses, that we're trying to work towards improving. But um, yeah, cardiac care in this valley is once again in limbo. So next slide. All right, purchase over orders over 10,000, and I'll park on this for a minute. Oh, <clears throat> so Alan, Alan Curtis, that was uh, some additional equipment to put our air packs in service that weren't wasn't anticipated because uh, the valve that connects to some of our other equipment they, they changed unbeknownst to us. So we had to. It, these are a bunch of machined adapters, and they're really proud of them. Um, Knox Company, so. We had we had some budgeted dollars for next year. We, we were able to recognize because of fuel savings and other things, an opportunity for these next three were some purchases that we've identified for next year. We were able to make a little early. One of them was uh, uh, under the direction of Chief Booth was getting our our Knox boxes upgraded. And what we've done is up, upgraded a lot of the gates and access points around the the community, and you need that Knox box, which is a controlled key, and there's a computerized box that that key lives in, and you have to punch in a code. It then tracks that code. So if we ever have a key lost or stolen, I can say Dory took it out at seven o'clock on Monday. Where's the key, Dory? And she can say, I don't know, I lost it. And then we do whatever we got to do. But um, it's just it's an accountability system because in years past around Sonoma Fire, we had a lot of volunteers that had a lot of keys cut, and I'm not exactly sure the process of turning them in when they retired was was foundationally solid. So it's an wow. opportunity for security. But yeah, again, with uh, the rescue equipment, our, our TRT team, you know, a lot of it, it's ropes and gear, and ropes can only drag across the rock so many times before you replace them. We identified an opportunity to replace them. Uh, expected replacement of July, we did it a little early, and we're able to reduce some of next year's budget dollars. And then Band of Brothers, this one took me a minute, but uh, Chief Lukowski did a great job of um, – identifying some issues at all of our stations with with the flooring and <clears throat> it was found that a couple of our stations that have good quality flooring were never professionally sealed in the first place okay. so we had firefighters that you know me for example i was in the navy i'm pretty good with a floor buffer 
but um, some of the chemicals and processes nowadays, they're it, going on, they're resealing our floors appropriately to give us a, establish a baseline so that going forward, they're easier to maintain, our stations look better and the floors last longer. And uh, it's an extensive process going across all the stations. Okay, next slide. Do you wanna get grossed out? <laughs> Look at the grout against the wall. That's what convinced me when Buzz said that. <laughs> the grout line next to the wall behind y'all. See what color the grout is right as it gets near the wall where no one steps. It lightens up. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. So what lives, I can't wait to see what happens, but I don't know what lives in these grout lines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to know. No. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think of the years where we used to bring pig, pig parts in for EMS training, and I don't know. Uh, social media engagement. Once again, pig bust. Yeah, we we continue to uh, we continue to rule. Uh, in fact, uh, fire department down south posted on our site after some of our comments to other fire departments. Sedona Fire for the win. So I'm pretty proud of that. Because <laughs> we we basically were stalking other fire departments, and Chief Coyle came up with a great tagline. It said, uh, "Base of Fire posted, hey, we're hiring," and Chief Coyle put on there. If city life's not your style, so no one's hiring too. But we got we got to advise you to wear out your mountain bike before you hit all our trails. And then it had a connection to our hiring page. And so all these other fire departments jumped in around the state and just it was healthy trash talking. But it it generated you you saw the upticks in in visits to everybody's sites. So we but with a few with some sarcasm, some fun, we we generated more people's interest in fire departments across the state. So. Um, Next slide. Next slide. And uh, that is it. If there are not any questions, that is the end of our presentation. We can All right. The next item. Thank you. I don't think there are any questions. You? I, I did enjoy all the new slides and pictures and <laughs> away from the norm that we were used to. More to come. More to come. <laughs> did you want to mention anything about uh, Friday? Yes, uh, I, I briefly touched on it, but yes, we've got the awards banquet on Friday. Um, the intent is at the request of staff that uh, I do a brief award ceremony and uh, Chairman Soto is gonna give, present some kind words on behalf of the board. And then uh, really us not having an awards banquet for a while and you know, looking back over the past few years and reflecting, we've hired a whole bunch of people and uh, and the intent, really, my intent of this of this event is to really have an environment where people can just get to know each other and uh, new to old spouses, new to old firefighters outside of the fire station, and uh, it's it's a part of um, a, a few initiatives we're working on to kind of expand that. We've we've now done some stuff with retirees and some other things, and it's just going to keep rolling and 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 just embrace the opportunities to to bring us back to center and in those values so i'm excited and i hope to see everybody there will there be uh other than firefighter family and board members and so on um other non-firefighter civilians there yes okay. yes great opportunity okay thank you chief uh last item on the agenda Board member items is basically discussion for board members fire district related activities since the last board meeting and I will begin well, thank you very much oh, no. uh. coming from um, an old man <laughs> quote from my the chairman um, um, this old man enjoyed a um, a good sit down meeting with fire chief and I always do. It's uh, it's more than uh, talking fire stuff. Um, we do, uh, but at the same time, it's a uh, a good time to get to on a personal level to get to know each other and so on. Uh, I enjoy these times. I really do. We are very fortunate uh, to have um, the uh, operational staff that we have, administrative staff, and so on. So uh, is, uh, this is just a great department. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Got it? Um, aside from 
the usual of uh, funny checks and things like that. I have nothing new to report. Okay, thank you. Helen. Um, like Janet, the usual firing, uh, signing checks, and uh, like uh, uh, Jean, I enjoyed a couple of visits actually, mm -hmm. both uh, spontaneous and scheduled with the chief. And um, I also think it's probably maybe off the agenda, but um, also think that there's a thank you in place to Chairman Soto and his wife for a Cinco de Mayo celebration for the board that was really quite wonderful. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. You're welcome. You know, you stole my thunder. <laughs> I, I was singing my first. Scott, what do you got for us? Oh same type of thing, people that come up, ask questions, and well, they want to know everything. Is my house going to burn down? No, I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, just kind of looking at the numbers that you're putting out there for hirees and hoping that certain people can get in there and at least do their best. Okay. Other than that, I got nothing. <laughs> All right, thank you. And lastly, um, spend a little bit of time in preparation for this meeting, uh, primarily as it related to... Uh, Community member. Um, also, I did have meet one on one with the chief, and we had a, uh, an opportunity to talk about a broad range of of uh, points that, that, as Jean mentioned, um, it, it, it's a pleasure just to just to sit and talk and get to the, the grassroots of thing rather than always being official. Um, <clears throat> I did attend a, a Dewey Humboldt Firewise um, Expo. It was over, held over at uh, Mortimer's Farm. It's quite an event, a lot of people. We had made a lot of good contacts. And uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun at Cinco de Mayo. Maybe we can make that uh, more of an annual thing than just once in a great-, great Next month. time I will Once every month? month? What? Yeah, once every month, right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, with that said, uh, look forward to uh, next month, our final finalization of the, of the budget and Chief Booth, it is good to see you back in the seat. So we're looking forward to you coming back uh, sooner rather than later. Okay. With that said, unless there's anything else from the board, Chief, Chief, or Chief, okay, <laughs> this meeting is adjourned. Yeah. Who this guy is. Yeah, sometime in the next month I will require an audience for you.